as an intro. So yeah, if you haven't gathered already, what we're going to be doing in today's video is taking a look at the Bearded Dragon, an authentic and original Australian lizard, which is why I had, you know, the didgeridoo. Uh, so, let's get on with it. So to start off, let's give a rundown of the Bearded Dragon's taxonomy. Now what this basically means for anybody who doesn't know, it's like where the animal is ranked on the phylogenetic tree of life, and by looking at the sort of titles, you know sort of which branch the particular organism lies along. So in the case of the Bearded Dragon, we have that it belongs to the clades, Eukaryota, Opistoconta, Metazoa, Bilateria, Chordata, Nathostomata, Tetrapoda, Lepidosauria, Squamata, Iguania, Agamidae, Amphibolurinae, and the genus Pagona. Now I know to a lot of people that is just a complete load of gobbledygook, but trust me, it is not. Those different names, like, they're all sort of generally Latin or Greek based, and they have some sort of meaning. But really what they tell you is how the animal is related to any other organism. So for example, the first group that I named was Eukaryota, which tells us that the bearded dragon, just like any other animal, is a member of the domain Eukaryota. And what that tells us is that it has all of its genetic information enclosed within a nucleus. Now I could go on at length about what all of the different groups are and like how they split and when they split because that's my bag but I know that it's not everybody's so I did just introduce that here for if you want to study that more. Now you'll see that I've been putting up a couple of pictures and so on of like the different groupings and they all come from a website called OneZoom which was recommended in one of Dawkins books so I'll leave a link down to that in the description if you want to find out about it and learn a little bit more about that. When we actually zoom in on those different groupings, you can actually learn a little bit more about the animal. So first up, we said that it was in the group Iguania. Now what this means is that it is related very closely to all of the other Iguanians, which includes Iguanas, Chameleons and the Agamids, as well as some other lizards. Within this, a sort of subclade is the family Agamidae. Now, a family is actually a specific taxonomic rank, um, but basically, again, because it is a clade, that means that all of the animals, or it might not necessarily be animals, you can have taxonomy for plants and, you know, non-eukaryotes like bacteria. Now, anyway, what this means is that all of the lizards within Agamidae are all more closely related to each other than they are to any other reptile or any other organism. Now there, are, there is like a sort of series of other clades within that, you could break it down into as many as you like really, but the one that we want to focus on here is the genus Pagona. Now depending on where you source your information, Pagona actually includes seven to nine different species, these being the Rankin's dragon, Pagona henry lawsoni, the Nullabore dragon, Pagona nullabore, um, I think the Eastern bearded dragon, Pag Pagona barbata, um, Mitchell's bearded dragon, Pagona michelli, um, Pagona micro lepidota, which I can't even remember the common name for, Pagona minor, the dwarf bearded dragon, and the one that we're talking about today, Pagona viticeps. Now, as I said earlier, all of these different clades tend to have words that actually have a little hidden meaning. So not only are they useful, they actually tell you a little bit about the animal. So the genus Pagona, that actually comes from the Greek word pogon, meaning beard, which, you know, you can see how that translates into the common name. And then the specific name of the bearded dragon that we are talking about is viticeps, which comes from some root meaning striped head. But moving on to the common name of the bearded dragon, the bearded dragon that we are actually referring to in today's video is the Centralian bearded dragon, or the Central bearded dragon, or the Inland bearded dragon, all sorts of the same name, but 
To work backwards through that name, we can actually learn a bit about the animal again. So first up, dragon. A dragon is generally any lizard belonging to the clade, which is, you know, in this case a family, a Garmidae, um, with the notable exception, of course, of the Komodo dragon, which is a monitor lizard and not an Agarmid at all. Another word back, we do encounter the good old word bearded. And for this, I'm going to take a detour into the second part of this video, which is a physical description of the bearded dragon. Now the bearded dragon's most distinguishing feature has got to be its beard of sharp scales that runs down the underside of its chin. Now this beard can actually be made to change colour from a stupid plain... Now this can actually be made to change colour in a similar way to how chameleons change their skin colour, um, but it isn't it hasn't got the same freedom as a chameleon's skin does. So it can range from a sort of light colour that is the base colour of the dragon's main body, and then it can also be turned to a jet black colour, in particular instances of emotional upheaval. As well as being able to change colour, the beard can actually change shape. So dragons which are particularly frightened, which is sort of what I mean by emotional upheaval, um, they do inflate the beard out to make themselves look bigger. And this is performed using the hyoid bone, which is a small bone in like the sort of lower head area, um, and that just sort of flicks forward to push the beard out. Beard stretching is not always done in an event of stress, however, um, because of a morning, bearded dragon keepers will frequently see their dragons sort of opening the mouths and sort of twisting the head like that a bit and flicking the beard out, and then afterwards they tend to inflate the bodies as well. Now, if they were sort of gaping and lunging forwards while doing this, that would sort of be a threat display to a predator, but they also do it to warm up, so by stretching the beard out and inflating the ribs, they increase their surface area to volume ratio and therefore allow themselves to warm up more effectively. And for anybody else who keeps beardies, we do just call this pancaking because, you know, why ruin such a funny looking thing with a really scientific term when you can just refer to it as sunlight breakfast product, you know. Now in the same vein, bearded dragons do have various means of communicating with each other. The beard is one, so changing colour to from light to dark is sort of something that they will do when they are feeling aggressive or territorial towards a member of their own species, but they also couple this up with a couple of gestures. So the most common one that you'll see is head bobbing. Now there are actually different variations on head bobbing, so a sort of occasional head bob I found is what Char, my bearded dragon, will do when he's just guarding his territory, so to speak. Um, that's usually coupled with a slight darkening of colour. But there are also more exaggerated head bobs. So male bearded dragons that are trying to impress a mate will frequently go to do head bobs that are so vigorous they almost look like push-ups. Um, and that is usually coupled with a really jet black beard. But then also all in between there are all sorts of different head bobs and it's almost like they have their own little language. In general though, head bobbing and beard darkening are sort of aggressive sort of indications, so they're either fear or anger, whereas there is a different form of behaviour which we call arm waving for obvious reasons, and this is generally done as a sign of submission. So female bearded dragons will do this to males when they are sort of conceding to their attempts to mate. You know what, I think we're neglecting Char at the minute because he's running round and you're missing most of it, so come on, we're moving. <coughs> eh. mm. Yeah, I'll come over here, that looks better, doesn't it? Now as you can tell from my pal over here, he's very active and one of those things about a bearded dragon's legs are that they are very strong. Now this is a trait sort of typical of Agarmid lizards that they do have very well developed and very muscular legs. So any bearded dragon you see, whether it's in the wild or in captivity, if it's healthy it will be able to put on a good turn of speed. If your bearded dragon's just sat in a hammock all day, there's something wrong. Another indicator of the bearded dragon's ability to move quite fast is its tail. So as you'll see from Char running about, his tail does look quite stiff and when he's hopping around it seems to like want to stay in the same position and only move up and down rather than side to side. And that sort of stiff rod-like tail 
is sort of an adaptation for running fast because you've got like muscle attachments going down into it. And one last thing on the physical nature of bearded dragons is that that tail is also another sort of indicator of what they are feeling at any given time. So a bearded dragon that is feeling particularly alert or excited will often make the tail go extra stiff and it will sort of curl up slightly over the back. But having discussed where the bearded and dragon come from in its name, we still have to talk about the third and final word, central. So this actually comes from the fact that the bearded dragon does live in Central Australia. There it does actually have quite a broad range um, and it does live in a number of habitats. So it'll live in sandridge deserts and sand plain deserts. Um, one example of a desert where it lives is the Simpson Desert and I'll chuck a picture up. So you can get the idea that these are quite hardy and heat tolerant animals. But on the other side of that, they do also live in woodland habitats, such as eucalyptus forests. Oh, and while we're on the vein of talking where words come from, eucalyptus actually means well covered, because apparently the flower of the eucalyptus tree has got a little cap over it. Now, in the parts of the, its range where there are trees, the bearded dragon is considered to be semi-arboreal because it does spend a lot of time up those trees and what they'll do is sort of perch themselves vertically or at 45 degrees and watch out for things that might interest them. So if there's any predators or prey coming by, they can just drop out of that tree and they're at full speed straight away. Now, talking about bearded dragons in captivity, Char is doing a good display of what that sort of behaviour is and how I've tried to allow him to do that within his enclosure. So I have a couple of branches dotted about. They're a bit too thin for him to climb on properly though, so I do want to change him out. Um, but uh, he does have that bit of cork over there that's sort of at the 45 degree slant and he does very frequently like to sit up on that. So it seems that in the wild, bearded dragons do actually eat a majority of animal matter, being small vertebrates and also any invertebrates that they can catch. And then alongside that, they will also eat plant matter. So really, these are truly opportunistic animals. Now, because animal matter is a lot more calorie dense than plant matter, um, where in the wild eating lots of animal matter is necessary because the bearded dragon is expending a lot of energy, in captivity there isn't quite that energetic demand and we sort of overcompensate for this by offering them more plant matter and as you can see down there Char has got a bowl of pea shoots, rocket and pak choi today. Now if you do want to learn more about what you should feed your pet bearded dragon then I have done a video all about that in the past so I'll throw a link up to that in the top right hand corner of the screen right now if you want to see it. Seasonal activity for the bearded dragon is a little bit upside down to what I'm used to because I live in England and that is in the Northern Hemisphere versus these fellas which naturally live in Australia and so all of the seasons are flipped round. Now in sort of May to June time, it is starting to turn to winter in Australia, so that is when these lizards will go down to hibernate, or what we call brewmate. There isn't really a proper technical reason for using the term brewmate as opposed to hibernate, and so it is a term that you can use interchangeably, but basically what they do throughout what in the Northern Hemisphere is the summer months, being June, July, August, that's their winter, and so what they are doing is just hunkering down in burrows and sleeping most of the time. Up until September comes, the most activity you're going to see in a wild bearded dragon is just occasionally coming out on some warm spells to bask, but apart from that they are basically inactive until September comes, at which point they are very active indeed. Now in captivity, bearded dragons are going to have to have this hibernation period just as they would in the wild. There are some dragons that don't seem to necessarily require it, but most bearded dragons do key into those changes in the weather, even if it's outside and the temperatures in their enclosures are exactly the same. Somehow they just manage to sense that, and so if you want a bearded dragon, learning how to cope and facilitate that hibernating process is something that you will have to look into. Now upon waking from hibernation, both captive and wild bearded dragons alike are fully intent on breeding. Now Char in his first year last year when he woke up out of brumation, he'd never brumated before or hibernated whatever you want to call it, um, he actually went off feed for a good number of weeks 
because he just seemed to be so interested in running around and bobbing his head and ostensibly looking for a mate. Now in the wild they do do something similar where they patrol the territory and bob the heads and you know males will fight off any other males from their region um, and then the females after they've mated they will lay their clutch of approximately 20 eggs. Now because bearded dragons are so highly territorial it is not a good idea at all to cohabitate them which basically means putting more than one in the same enclosure because males are just going to fight to the death that's just the way it is for them and even though females can sort of tolerate each other it often happens where they just suddenly decide that no this is my territory not yours and an all-out battle commences and it does just happen too frequently to be worth it. But the last little bit of information I want to talk about with bearded dragons in the wild is how they are actually doing. So because nowadays lots of species are unfortunately struggling because of the way that humans are impacting on the environment, um, there is a lot of concern about whether things are going to go extinct and so on. But luckily in the case of the bearded dragon, that is not really a concern. They are rated as least concerned by the IUCN red list, which is good to hear. Now saying that, the wild populations aren't without danger because introduced species such as feral cats and red foxes will kill bearded dragons, but the numbers don't seem to be suffering from that. His head popping again. So yeah guys, I hope that that's taught you a little bit more about bearded dragons. I mean, with a lot of these species that we keep, we tend to see them in captive environments so much more often than we see them in the wild, that it sort of becomes the case that people stop thinking of them as wild animals and start to believe that they are totally removed from that. But Reptiles on the, on the whole have been kept for such a short period of time that their requirements and behaviour has not altered in the slightest, as you can tell by this bugger keeps bloody head bobbing. <laughs> but yeah, hopefully this video has taught you a little bit more about that, and when you're thinking about keeping your own beardies, you'll keep this in mind. So anyway, this is a convenient time for me to stop because the dog over the, like, somebody's house nearby started barking again which makes it impossible to film so i hope you enjoyed the video if you did leave it a like leave us a comment i've been jtb reptiles teaching you how to follow nature's example and i'll see you in the next one bye guys